Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everybody here this morning. I remember, actually, this goes way back, but I remember a movie that I saw as a kid that was an old, well, it's old now, but it was a World, World War II movie. Some of you re may remember seeing it as well. It was a movie that involved a U.S. submarine and a whole bunch of Japanese battleships. The name of the movie was Run Silent, Run Deep. Anybody see that? Remember seeing that? All right. Good deal. It stars uh, Burt Lancaster and Clark Gable. That was a biggie back then. Had them both on the screen at the same time. Now, we have a clip from the, uh, from the movie that we're going to show you, uh, but it's actually a trailer for the movie, so it's advertised in the movie, and it contains scenes in there that I want you to pay uh, particular attention to. There's scenes of dialogue about a possible uh, mutiny, and there's also some action scenes. However, there's just one scene that's relevant to our message today, just one scene that I want you to notice. It is a scene where the enemy destroyers take a turn and start coming at the floating on the surface submarine. The sub, again, is actually on the surface and the, the destroyers are coming towards the surface. What I want you to notice is what happens when the captain, or I guess it's not a captain, I guess the commander, uh, calls for the floating sub to submerge and get away from the attacking destroyers. What do you see and what do you hear when that happens? Let's watch the clip.
I actually had nightmares about a torpedo falling off the rack and, and hitting me like it did in that one. That movie was out in 1958, by the way. So what did you hear and what did you see when uh, the destroyers uh, were coming at the floating sub? What did you hear the commander say? Nobody? Nobody got it? The commander says, well, let's play the audio clip. You heard what's known as a klaxon horn, or sound, and the words, dive, dive, dive. That's what happens when the floating sub sees uh, destroyers coming at them. A sudden sense of urgency, urgency strikes the crew members of the sub. They scurry around and the klaxon horn sounds. And over the intercom, the voice of the commander says, Dive! 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 The battleships, meanwhile, are steaming towards the sub, intending to blast a few holes in its side. Well, today we are continuing our series, as Jennifer said, on the Backyard Barbecue. Over the last few weeks, we have been focusing on different themes that occur during a barbecue. We talked about what the cross and flame means of the United Methodist Church. We actually talk about other logos and what they mean and how that flame relates to our backyard barbecue. Last week, we talked about all the distractions that can occur at a barbecue. And those distractions were bugs. And those distractions can also affect our Christian life. Distractions that get in the way of our thinking about God. Well, today our barbecue, we are talking about fellowship. Something that you'll have. You'll have lots of friends and neighbors over for your barbecue. So we have, we're going to talk about fellowship. And when you have a lot of friends and neighbors over, what do you talk about? What do you talk about with your friends and neighbors? It gives us an opportunity to talk about church. It gives us an opportunity to talk about our faith. The entire time we have our friends in backyard, at the backyard barbecue over, we can share our faith with them. We can talk about just how important faith is in our lives and how the church cultivates our faith. How our church brings us closer to God, we can talk about. We can talk about how our church is looking for new members that will give us at least 10% of their income. We can talk about how our faith gives us comfort when we talk about or think about eternity. We can talk about how our faith brings joy to our hearts when something really terrible happens. And how our church and how our faith will do the same thing to each of our friends and our guests. We can tell them how good our faith is and how good our church is and how they will be affected by it. After all, we have a captive audience in our backyard barbecue and they're enjoying everything we're doing. Am I right about all this? Is that something you can do at a backyard barbecue, Don? Talk about your faith and get everybody excited about it. What do you think? Do you want to boast or to host a barbecue with all your friends and neighbors so you can get them to join the church? I think that's a, something that we can do. What is going to happen if you've got all your friends over at this barbecue and you just talk about joining the church and you share your faith? What's going to happen? Right. You're going to hear this. 
<laughs> They're going to be these, this submarine and say, dive, 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 I'm getting away from this guy. They're going to become submarines because we're the battleships coming after them. They will react the same way that the submarine does. They're going to get out of the way. Now, you may not see that or hear that, but that's exactly what they're thinking. They're thinking to themselves, I've got to get out of here. This, is, this guy's crazy. Because we don't have them in the right place. We don't have the right relationship to do that. To just bring and invite friends over for barbecue and then start pushing our Christianity on them. They're going to dive. They're going to get away. So why do you suppose that is? Why can't we tell others about our faith and the benefits of our church without them saying to themselves, I got to get away from this guy. This is a Jesus freak. Remember they used to call them Jesus freaks back in the 70s. So how can we look more like a luxury ship that's invited to pull alongside their submarine instead of a battleship that's coming at them with all of our guns and our depth charges. How can we be invited to pull alongside? It all boils down to uh, something that we have talked before about, and that is relationships, the importance of relationships. Study after study shows that what's most important in our lives is what that one person that we think loves us what they think about us that drives that motivates us the person that we respect the person that we like what they think about us drives how we're going to live and that's the importance of relationships we know that it's difficult to talk with other folks about our faith and about our church you really can't invite them over for a barbecue and then start to nail them about christianity they're going to dive but today, we're going to talk about lessons. Everybody's had a lesson one time or two in their life. Music lessons, dance lessons, hockey lessons, tennis lessons. We've all had lessons. Our society is actually focused on lessons. Look at the uh, success of community colleges. They provide continuing education for people. And they're very successful at doing that. So lessons are very much a part of our society. I have to take continuing education all the time. I mean, I have to tell them what I'm doing and, and they get a report on how that is and how I'm doing and how I'm handling the lessons. In school, you have lessons and then a test. In life, you have a test and you receive the lesson. Just the opposite. But the very first le lesson that we have in building relationships with others is showing that you care about them. You see, people really don't care how much you know until you, they know how much you care. Caring about others brings... Uh, we can learn about caring about others in just four easy lessons. Remember, this all begins, everything we do, everything that we uh, uh, are when we relate to other people, all begins with acting like a Christian, our behavior. They notice our behavior. If you love God and you love neighbor, they're going to notice. So the number one lesson is making sure that we act like a Christian. And so when we start talking about Christianity, they're not going to be surprised. They're going to say, of course, I knew that. I can tell by the way you behave. I can tell by the way you act. We're going to talk about kindness. You build people up by kindness and not by criticism. Kindness is giving people what they need, not what they necessarily deserve. Jesus gave people four things. The same four things that you need to learn um, to give if you're going to be a people builder. We're going to talk about building other people up. If you're going to bring out the best in their life, 
You might recognize Joel Osteen. That's what he talks about, is building people up. Number one, you have to give people a personal challenge. A challenge always brings the best out in people. And number two, you give people complete confidence. We not only need a challenge to invest our, uh, to invest our lives in, but the confidence to do it. They gotta believe that what you're telling them they can do, they have the confidence to do it. You have to give people honest counsel. You have to level with them. You can't BS your way through. Sometimes you need uh, to level with people in order to bring out the best in them. Tell them the truth to their face and give honest counsel. And you also have to give them credit. You have to make sure that you give them credit. Give them full credit. This is from a book that uh, was written by Ken Blanchard. It's called The One Minute Manager. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it or ever heard of Ken Blanchard, but we're going to start off with some scripture in Ephesians. It says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Paul is urging people to make uh, their life count. He's urging people to uh, recognize who they are and what they are and make it count. He's challenging us. He's saying, don't waste your lives. Be all that God has made you to be and make your life count. Why does he do that? Because we all need a cause, a project, a dream that calls us to perform. It strengthens us when we do that. For 12 years, the Green Bay Packers, I don't know if we have any Packers fans here. Beth, I know you are. The Green Bay Packers won only 31% or 30% of their games. By 1958, they were 1 and 10. They had a losing season for 12 years. They were a terrible team. And then along came a guy by the name of Vince Lombardi. What a man, what a motivator. He was a people builder, just as we're talking about us becoming today. During the next nine-year reign at the Packers, he had nine winning seasons, and they beat their opponents 75% of the time and walked away with five national championships, including the first two Super Bowls. It was Lombardi that was uh, influential in getting the Super Bowl played. Lombardi was a people builder. He knew how to bring out the best in people. And he did that by issuing personal challenges to the players. We all know that there is more to life than just living for yourself. There must be a cause, a reason, a purpose that we live. And that purpose says that I am here to do something and not just take up space. Why am I here? What's the reason behind it? All of us need somebody in our lives who can inspire us to first of all recognize that and then achieve that, to give us that challenge. There are people in your life that God wants to use for you to be a people builder. Bring out the best in others and to inspire people to be what he knows they could be. You need to be a people builder. Rather than criticizing the worst in others, bring out the best. Challenge the best in others. It's quite simple. You find out what they're good at and you challenge them to do something. All of us have weaknesses, but you need to build on their strengths. If you're going to be a people builder to bring out the best in people around you, it's important that you give them a personal challenge. So number two that we're going to talk about is give them complete confidence. How do you give somebody confidence? In Romans 15, we see Paul writing, he says, We who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak in order to build them up in their faith. We all need confidence. When somebody believes in you, it brings out the best in you. Think about that. Think about your own personal life. 
Did you have somebody other than yourself that actually believed in you, that challenged you? I did, and of all people, it was my dentist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strange, but it, it, he was. It gives you courage. It gives you the confidence to say, I know I can do that. Now, Jesus did that with Peter. It's quite uh, interesting. Peter's name uh, was actually Petros, which meant pebble. It means pebble. Jesus said, pebble, you're going to be a rock. He says, I'm giving you a new name. And when Jesus said that to Peter, he was anything but a rock. He was still a pebble. He was Mr. Impulsive, Mr. Foot and Mouth. And he was, Mr., hey, let's just go ahead and do it. Walking on water and then the great slip up. Jesus said, you're going to be a rock. And Jesus didn't tell him what he was. He told him what he could be. That's potential and that's building confidence that he built finally in Peter. As we know, Peter finally got it right. Whenever you label somebody, you reinforce what they are. If you call them lazy or unorganized, as I get called a lot, uh, temper problems, they become what that label is. They focus on that label. Don't tell people what they are. Tell them what they could be. It builds them up. In Thessalonians, Paul writes, uh, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, encourage one another and build each other up. Here he's talking about the power of affirmation. If you're going to be a people builder, you've got to be a good encourager. You've got to be able to encourage other people. Ken Blanchard said, catch people doing something right and then tell them what they're doing. It's quite simple. Finally see what they're doing right and then tell them. Suggestions on giving encouragement. When you encourage people, it, means it needs to be real and from the heart and not some kind of phony manipulation. It's got to be real. It's got to be right. It needs to be sincere, genuine, and real. It needs to be regular. Don't be stingy with your encouragement. Give it out all the time. Don't be stingy with it. Don't hold on to it. Encourage everybody. The waitress, the taxi driver, the Uber driver. Do we ever get Uber here in Sioux City? You know? No, we never did. Okay. Um, everybody around you, you can do it. There's a pastor in Yankton by the name of Ron Johnson, and he embarrasses me sometimes because he is always encouraging everybody he meets. The waitress comes up, oh, you're doing a good job today. And she just said, good morning. <laughs> but he's always there doing it. And people are walking on air when he leaves. He does it to everybody. It needs to be recognizable. For it to be effective, you need to be precise. You need to be right. You don't need to be vague about it. The more specific you are in encouraging people, the greater the impact is going to be on them. The more power it packs. Don't say, I enjoyed the meal. Okay? This is what Ron Johnson would say. He'd say, I can tell you spent a lot of time putting this together and effort in this meal. And the seasoning that you put into it was just about perfect. And they're walking on air. Don't say, you did a good job. Say, I noticed you handled that crazy customer with class and tact, and you really maintained your cool under pressure. See the difference? You did a good job, or here's why you did a good job. Here's what's noticeable. Be specific. Have you ever had a compliment sometimes, and this happens to me a lot, and you don't know whether or not it was a compliment? <laughs> You question it. For example, I appreciate the things you say to me or said to me out on the patio, but sometimes I don't know where you're coming from. Okay? The little boy that said, Pastor, you were really full of it. <laughs> A lady said to me one time, when you speak, I think he's never going to get any better. <laughs> What, what does she mean by that? 
A guy said, I think you're the model pastor. Went home and looked up the word model. It said, a cheap plastic imitation of the real thing. <laughs> a guy said, your sermons are like water to a drowning man. Another guy who started falling asleep during the service afterwards said, I'm sure you noticed that my eyes were closed, but I didn't miss a thing. <laughs> Give them honest counsel from the heart, very sincere. There is no progress without learning. We all know that. And there is no learning without feedback. Feedback is very important. We all need honest feedback. Since none of us are perfect, or is perfect, our perception gets off base when we need people to say, you're off base. He says, we all need people who will lay it out for us and be honest. Now, many of you know, I used to work for Purina in the livestock end of things, and we sold livestock products primarily feed and the last thing in the world we needed was feedback <laughs> it's coming it's coming in proverbs we can read people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron we bring out the best in each other. An honest answer is the sign of a true friendship. A real friend will tell you when you're making a mistake. A real friend will level with you, will be honest with you. They care enough to correct you. And they care enough to give you comfort. If you're honest and positive about it. They'll lay it on the line, even when it's painful to tell the truth. You do it. I think you're off base here. You're wasting your life. They don't, that, that's not the way to do it. They don't just let people waste their life in silence. Proverbs says, a friend means well, even when he hurts you. He's doing it for your benefit. Boy, that's hard to realize, Mike. <laughs> When you do that, it still hurts. But I know deep down in the long run, it's for my benefit. So the focus on improvement, you focus on improvement, not punishment. You don't punish. You focus on affirming the person and you correct the behavior. Okay? You love the sinner, but you hate the sin. You focus on affirming the person. Speak the truth and in love. And finally, we talk about giving them full credit, making sure that they receive credit. If you want to be a people builder, bring out the best in the people in your life and give them full credit for everything they do. Praise the growth and challenge, uh, and challenge you to see more in their lives if you recognize their growth. Many of you are familiar with the sign that says just how much you can get done if nobody seeks the credit. One of the things that impressed me about Norman Schwarzkopf in the Desert Storm operation was that he was constantly giving credit away always doing it he was always pointing to the guys in the trenches to his under command and to the president and to Colin Powell or whoever Schwarzkopf was a genius he actually had a an IQ of 170 he was a mastermind but he was always talking about how other people did what they did he always gave credit to other people now, when you look at these four things on how to be a people builder, give them personal challenge, give them complete confidence, give them honest counsel, and give them full credit, there's a lot of work. It's, it's not easy to do this. And you won't always feel like doing it because it is so hard. Kindness always has a cost to it. There's a price tag for being a people builder. 
It takes a lot of work. It requires time, effort, money, energy, lack of privacy even. It always costs to be kind. Question is, is it worth it? Absolutely. Being a people builder. Why should you do it then? In response to God, what God has done for us, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other. God's been kind to you, therefore you be kind to others. We oftentimes look at that uh, in terms of love. We say God has loved and forgiven you, and therefore we are asked to love and forgive others. Kindness also fits into that. First, by helping them grow and become and recognize their strengths. Focus on their strengths. Then sharing the benefits of Christ in your life. And when you share the benefits of Christ in your life with that person you're trying to counsel honestly, and you have that kind of a relationship to do that, they're going to say, I want what you have. I want what you have because you can now counsel them about what Christ has done in your life and how the church benefits that. So you can have your backyard barbecue and if you have the right relationship with the people that are there, you can talk about anything. But most importantly, you can talk about the benefit of Christ in your life. When you help other people win, you win. Any executive of a successful corporation knows that. You make other people successful and it makes you successful. Remember, we talked about if you could listen to somebody, you can appear to be a genius when all you did was listen to what they had to say. You will build, uh, become a people builder and they will begin to think better of themselves. If you can get other people to think better of themselves, you will be successful. When this happens, it's called the halo effect. When this happens, you're wearing the halo and they see it. Kind people are happy people. They're fulfilled people. Unkind people are actually very miserable. Happy people attract other people. And the people who serve others and give their lives away, that really brings enjoyment to a couple of lives. Theirs and yours. Amen. If we could have our ushers come forward, please.